Okay, thank you for having me. This has been a very informative uh, session. I've learned a lot today, and I'm the last speaker, so I'm going to try to take as long as I possibly can. <laughs> so <laughs> keep me here as long as possible. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so I'm excited to share with you some of our work on imaging mechanisms of change, and pretty consistent with what we've been discussing today. Uh, the goals are really to understand the effects of interventions on critical components of addiction, which in turn would predict recovery. And hopefully I'll make an argument for really triangulating between intervention, brain-based phenotypes and clinical phenotypes so that we can actually not make assumptions about what the mechanisms are and possibly get closer to testing them. So uh, in this presentation, I'm going to be illustrating this approach, a uh, study we just completed, looking at methamphetamine-dependent patients. And uh, for them, the intervention was naltrexone. I hope the fall, the, you know, the floor doesn't fall down and say naltrexone. But, uh, so the intervention here is naltrexone. Uh, we're going to be talking about functional connectivity, doing Q exposure. And we're going to be linking this back to clinical phenotypes, in particular, self-reported craving. So uh, why methamphetamine? Well, it's a pretty big problem. It's a highly neurotoxic drug with very long duration of intoxication. Uh, it's a problem in the western states and definitely a problem in Los Angeles. So we've been doing some work with this population. There's very few treatment options. Um, CBT is only modestly effective. Treatment dropout is very, very high. As with other addiction phenotypes, there's some concern about the heterogeneity of the, of the diagnostic phenotype. So I'll be talking more about the concept of craving as a clinical endpoint. And of course, there's no FDA-approved pharmacotherapies uh, for any stimulant use disorders, uh, despite a lot of investment uh, from NIDA uh, to get those treatments developed. So, Craving gives us an opportunity to really consider the incentive salience theory of addiction. And, and that's really what I'm going to use to anchor um, a lot of the discussion of the findings today. The idea is that addiction is caused by progressive neuroadaptation in mesolimbic and negostriatal pathways, uh, causing these pathways to be sensitized. Uh, what that translates into is increased attribution of motivational salience to cues, and um, then you have the expression of wanting or craving. So we hope to target this um, using naltrexone, as you probably know, is primarily an opioid receptor antagonist with highest affinity for mu, uh, also some affinity for kappa opioid receptors, uh, FDA approved for alcoholism, also approved for opioid dependence, although very different mechanisms for those two disorders. And um, we just published a study now in neuropsychopharmacology showing that naltrexone does attenuate Q-induced craving for methamphetamine. Also, uh, when you give a controlled dose of methamphetamine, an infusion of methamphetamine in the laboratory, and naltrexone also blocks some of the rewarding effects of, of IV methamphetamine. So how does it do that? Well, one of the mechanisms, the better understood ones, would be uh, the modulation of dopamine transmission from the VTA to the nucleus accumbens, possibly by interacting with the uh, GABA interneurons. Now, um, in the broader perspective of addiction um, neurobiology, we want to consider reward and reinforcement circuitry. And you can see the modulation of um, dopaminergic activity can have multiple implications in pathways um, in, in the midbrain and, and uh, PFC, also uh, implicating glutamate and GABA feeding back into some of the uh, midbrain structures. So I'll be talking more about this as we get into the functional connectivity. So a brief summary so far, I've said that um, methamphetamine addiction is really uh, a problem for which there are no available treatments. Craving is a translational phenotype, so we're anchoring our study uh, on understanding craving and ameliorating craving in the scanner. Um, we think that naltrexone affects Q-induced craving via modulation of mesolimbic functioning. So um, to get at this um, in a more mechanistic sense, what I'm going to be showing you is a uh, placebo control, randomized control trial of uh, methamphetamine. And participants are completing a neuroimaging protocol um, on both naltrexone and placebo. So they're going to serve as their own controls here. Um, 
Let me tell you what the research questions are. Of course, we want to start by um, showing that we have a Q reactivity task that actually works. So we don't want to take for granted this because there's no published studies of uh, Q reactivity to methamphetamine uh, in the scanner. We also want to correlate that with self-reported craving. It's really important that we don't make assumptions, that we understand DLPFC is uh, activated, therefore it must mean X, Y, or Z. We would like as much as possible to find that uh, to be related to self-reported clinical um, phenotypes. Then, of course, we want to after we look at the validity of our test, we want to look at uh, naltrexone effects. But before we can actually look at naltrexone effects, one thing that gets talked a lot about but very seldom implemented is we want to rule out the effects of the medication on cerebral blood flow. And there's a special step for doing so. It's an ASL sequence, and I'll be showing that um, today. So um, to get a little bit more mechanistic, what we want to do is set seed regions and look at how naltrexone may alter functional, functional connectivity from the seed regions with the seed regions. And we are focusing on reinforcement-related, opioidergic, and Q-reactive regions. I'll tell you more about that. And again, going back to self-reported craving as a way to interpret these uh, connectivity findings. So a brief uh, overview of our study. Participants come in. Um, we do an in-person screening. If they're eligible, they go on to a physical exam. Obviously, there's a medication involved. Um, then they come in for the first medication day. The big if here is testing negative for methamphetamine. So that's a pretty significant thing that we're asking our patients to do. They take the medication under observation. They do that for three days, and on day three, they complete the neuroimaging session, which includes structural, ASL, and our Q's task. Uh, there's a washout period, and they have the same procedures for the second um, drug. So we worked pretty hard to complete this study. We talked to almost 1,000 people over the phone, um, brought in 200 individuals to the lab, uh, had 60 physical exams, and randomized 28 participants. Uh, 24 completed both sessions. We're down to uh, 23 because one patient was excluded due to excessive motion. So I'm reporting uh, 23 as our final number. Um, so a little bit on our sample. These folks are average age of 35, uh, mostly male. The, um, they meet criteria for a meth use disorder, um, report 10 years on average of meth use, and uh, reported using methamphetamine 18 out of the past 30 days. So this is from uh, the timeline follow-back. And about... Um, two-thirds of them were smokers. Now remember, they serve as their own controls. That's one of the advantages of our design. So let me tell you about this task. As I said earlier, uh, we did not find in the literature a task for methamphetamine uh, Q reactivity. So Kelly Courtney, a wonderful grad student who's now at UCSD for her internship, she developed this task and we have three types of cues. We have a drug cue, paraphernalia and consumption um, categories, and then we have control cues, as you can see, are pretty well matched based on kind of visual parameters and also the presence of uh, people. That's an important aspect to match um, on a task. This is what the task looks like. It's a block design. You can ascertain that. You have five second presentation of the cues. Uh, you have a response rate. This is where we're going to derive our urge rating and a rest period. We have two runs, six minutes each. And uh, before I get into the bold response, let me show you the subjective rating. So this is pretty standard self-reported rating for methamphetamine, urge rating for methamphetamine, and you can tell right away that when the meth cues are presented, ratings are much higher than when the control cues are presented. In this design, we did not detect medication effects. Um, so now, let's get to, uh, to some of the bold results. Now we're looking at the task and we're contrasting math cue to control cue. This is across medications. 
And as you can see, a pretty robust pattern of activation for uh, the meth versus control cues, and that includes a lot of our usual suspects, uh, VTA, CAUTA, precanus. We'll be talking a lot more about that as we, as we go on. But that gave us some good confidence that we had a task that really engaged uh, the circuitry expected uh, in, the, in these kinds of studies. So um, how does that really relate to self-reported craving? That's one of the questions we had. And to do that, as I mentioned earlier, we entered uh, self-reported craving into our models. And what we found, and this is only for the placebo conditions, a positive correlation indicating greater self-reported craving and higher activation of the um, IFG and dorsal lateral PFC. So, um, in summary, what we have at the beginning, um, successful uh, task at eliciting Q-induced craving. Uh, the task elicits uh, Q-reactivity in regions that are commonly implicated in, in Q-exposure, Q-reactivity uh, paradigms, including some of our uh, own work. And there's greater activation of prefrontal regions, particularly IFG and the LPFC um, during meth Q's processing on placebo as it correlates to meth craving. That was not found in an altrexone condition and there were no negative relationships, negative correlations. So now we can move on and ask some questions about, well, what about naltrexone? What about our intervention? Well, I told you earlier we wanted to be confident that uh, any medication effects weren't due to changes in cerebral blood flow and to address that uh, we had to extract mean global gray matter CBFs from both conditions and then compare them. You can do the global comparison, you can also do voxel wise comparisons. Thankfully, there were no differences. I'm presenting here the whole brain CBF estimates uh, for placebo and naltrexone. There were no differences. If you look at voxel-wise comparisons, also no differences once you apply a threshold for multiple comparison. So that was good, a little easier analysis going forward, um, but really more confident in the results. And um, now we can start by saying, in the sort of snapshot of brain activation in the uh, meth versus control cues, um, how did naltrexone compare to placebo? And what we find here is these areas were more active on placebo than naltrexone. So naltrexone decreased activation of some of these sensory motor regions, so postcentral and precentral gyrus, and also the occipital cortex. That was our initial finding. So it attenuated, as I mentioned, sensory uh, activation, sensory motor and visual regions during MATH-Q processing. This is actually quite consistent with studies of uh, naltrexone and Q reactivity, including our study um, looking at smokers. There are also, as I said, no alterations in CBF. And with that, we can move on to what we thought were the more mechanistic and interesting questions here, which is, um, is naltrexone associated with differential functional connectivity during Q reactivity compared to placebo? And if so, um, well, here are our a priori seed regions. Uh, as I mentioned, we were interested in regions implicated in reward and reinforcement. Because of the pharmacology of naltrexone, we're also looking at opioid-rich areas in the brain, and that's why the PhD, PhD comes in. It's not an area that you see very often. Um, and the precuneus, which we have implicated uh, in Q reactivity, I'll discuss more in a second. So this is just a, uh, showing you our ROIs, because our functional connectivity is based on this a priori ROIs. And uh, we wanted to look to see how active uh, these ROIs were, because remember the previous comparisons were whole brain, they were not um, ROI uh, driven. And we need these ROIs to set them as seeds to see which areas of the brain um, activate uh, in, in in tandem with these seeds. And just to show you here, these areas were actually pretty uh, consistently active in the naltrexone with the exception of nucleus accumbens and also on placebo. Um, so substantiates really using this um, ROIs going forward. So a little bit before I show you the results about the technique for using a PPI analysis. This is a technique for investigating task-related um, changes in the relationship between brain areas, and we're looking to see 
uh, voxels in the brain that increase their relationship with the seed during the task. So the best way that we know to interpret them is really uh, increased flow of information between these brain areas during the task. Another way to say that is sort of correlated activation, uh, one way to think about it. Nothing about this procedure enforced causation. That's a really important thing to say from the outset. So um, we're going to start by looking at the PhD, PhD as our seed region. And here we have actually greater um, activation on placebo versus naltrexone. So naltrexone is effectively uh, decreasing connectivity from the PhD to uh, the occipital regions. When you look at the precuneus, an interesting pattern emerges. Again, naltrexone is um, decreasing activation. You see greater activation on placebo versus naltrexone. It's decreasing activation in the post-central and pre-central gyrus. I just mentioned those areas to you uh, in our earlier work, and I'll try to integrate them more into, into our understanding. Uh, when you look at the VTA, now you have a different pattern. So I'll call your attention to the fact that naltrexone is increasing function connectivity um, between the VTA and frontal uh, regions. We see a similar pattern with the caudate. Um, again, now Traxon is potentiating increasing uh, connectivity from the, um, from the uh, caudate to uh, frontal regions. So here's a bit of a summary of what's been going on so far. Um, in the solid lines, you have uh, pathways that have been, uh, they're stronger on naltrexone versus placebo. And the dashed lines here will show you pathways that were uh, weaker, connectivity pathways that were weaker on naltrexone uh, versus placebo. And this blotched little orange areas are those regions uh, where uh, naltrexone found to attenuate activation during Q's processing. So, Starting to paint a picture again that um, we're very interested in knowing the um, the pharmacology of of, um, of naltrexone, but what we really wanted to do is take a step back and say, well, let's not assume that we know what these pathways are really telling us. Let's ask the question of whether subjective reports of craving um, can inform these medication moderated functional connectivity results. And so we entered these self-reported craving. Uh, measures into our models. We also use different scores. I don't think I have the scatter plots to show you, but I'm going to summarize for you here that for two of our um, seed connectivity findings, um, we found associations with subjective cravings. So for both the caudate to PFC and precuneus to PFC, we found that that was associated with um, lower cravings. So the more naltrexone increased the activation, the more it decreased craving. And the same pattern actually we found for precuneus, and I I remind you, precuneus is connecting here to the sensory motor regions. Um, so, you know, what may be going on, our best guess, and again, understanding that we're not inferring causation, is that perhaps now Trexone is increasing this uh, the connectivity from VTA to PFC, uh, this primarily a, a dopaminergic pathway, and we think that kappa um, opioid receptors may be implicated in this, in this pathway. Um, also, this might disinhibit uh, glutamatergic uh, neurons and sort of their connection back to the dorsal uh, striatum. And uh, Kent has spoken about this earlier, but we think in some ways now Traxon may be strengthening, and these are the solid lines that remind you, may be strengthening some of these uh, control networks, the same with the um, Precuneus, we believe this is probably a glutamatergic pathway. And, and finally, it's weakening the association between the precuneus and sensory motor regions. And we think of the precuneus as really integrating sensory information that's necessary to experience um, Q induced craving. And um, so, uh, in summary, here's what we found with this study. Uh, we have a task that successfully elicits uh, Q-induced craving, both subjective and in terms of bold uh, response. There is greater subjective craving related to um, enhanced recruitment of the, the PFC. Uh, now, Traxon moderated Q reactivity that was specific to sensory motor regions, and that's what you get from that sort of um, 
snapshot of comparing differences in brain activation. Um, but really, I think our more interesting findings will come from the functional connectivity. Uh, we ruled out CBF differences by medication. And here are some of the functional connectivity summaries. Uh, now, Trexone, we believe, modulates dorsal trait on VTA and PHG and precuneous functional connectivity with visual, sensory, and motor regions. We think it results in reduced activation of these regions. It also enhances dorsal trait on VTA and sensory motor regions functional connectivity with the frontal cortex. Um, it weakens associations between subjective craving and precuneous functional connectivity with sensory motor regions. It also strengthens those relationships. Uh, with dorsal stratum and precuneous connectivity with the um, frontal region. So one way to put it is we think that naltrexone may be functioning to reduce the salience of the methamphetamine cues and potentially uh, cue-induced craving by reducing sensory motor processing and integration, which I think the precuneous is a key player in that, in that process, and by engaging greater frontal um, regulation of salience attribution via dopaminergic, glutamatergic, and GABAergic pathways uh, linking dorsal strait and precuneous to these uh, sensory motor regions. So, you know, as Kent alluded to earlier, we might be seeing some of these um, uh, control networks really exerting more top-down regulation of craving and maybe a little bit more difficulty uh, integrating all the sensory experiences that are required to fully uh, experience self and self-report craving. So, of course, you know, we're excited about this study. Um, we think the design is uh, well suited for the kinds of analysis that we did, especially the uh, crossover design. We're excited to, um, and Kelly did a wonderful job of really getting on top of these ASL sequences to rule out CBF differences. We think this is a clinical sample um, that has a lot to offer. We have a lot of neuropsych uh, information on them that can also be helpful. Uh, obviously, we cannot infer causality. That's a critical piece here, even with the functional connectivity, we're so tempted to do that, but we really cannot. Uh, now, trexone treatment was acute to only three days, so we ought to consider that. Um, in terms of subjective craving, we were working with a four button box. I think we can do better if we can have a little bit more uh, of a typical range of craving. I think we're working on that um, for some of our next studies. So, you know, we're excited because this gives us some evidence that um, naltrexone induced changes in, in bold measures um, of meth craving. And so that's consistent with our laboratory study. Um, we're excited about trying to get after mechanisms and, and really uh, beyond those associations in which we often infer mechanism and then we get caught into reverse causality and, and so forth. And it's so hard not to, right? Because we're trying to make sense of things. Um, I think there's some opportunities here. One would be uh, the prediction of relapse, some ideas for personalized medicine I'd love to discuss. I'm especially excited about using these types of tests as probes of the progression of addiction. I think that uh, there's a lot of wonderful adolescent brain development that's very important to study, but there's also addiction progression that needs to be studied. And I think these kinds of tests can really help us uh, map that on from a, a, a rational kind of theoretical viewpoint. Um, so with that, I just want to thank you all for having me. I want to thank um, the folks in my lab, and I want to acknowledge Kelly Courtney, who's just phenomenal and has done the lion's share of this work. I'm really, really proud of her. Um, and thank you all. <laughs>